Hey everybody, it's nutritionist Amy Berger from toitnutrition.com bringing you another installment in doing keto without the crazy. Today's topic is keto without a gallbladder. Um, I recommend that you watch this even if you do still have your gallbladder, hopefully most of you do, um, because I think you'll learn something, hopefully. So, you know, before I go on, as always, thank you for subscribing and um, check out my website for upcoming appearances where we can meet in person. Won't that be fun? Okay, I'm not going to waste time like I normally do. Let's jump right in. So, the reason I wanted to do this is because I get a lot of questions. Um, as to can I do keto without a gallbladder? Do I need to do anything special? You know, like my doctor said I shouldn't do a high fat diet, what's the deal? So can you do a ketogenic or low carb, higher fat diet without a gallbladder? Yes, you sure absolutely can. And the fact is, most people who don't have their gallbladder anymore don't require any special modification at all. They can do keto just fine. Um, some people might have some issues and we'll get into that. So um, let's talk about why this matters, what the gallbladder does, why things can happen when it's removed and all that stuff. So your gallbladder is... <laughs> It's the, the holding tank for bile. And what bile does is it emulsifies fat. It doesn't actually digest fat. It's not a digestive enzyme. So it doesn't, um, you know, well, uh, it's like detergent to dirt. What bile does is primarily to fat. It takes a big fat molecule and breaks it up into lots of teeny tiny fat molecules. And by breaking it up into lots of teeny tiny fat molecules, it gives the digestive enzymes that do digest fat more surface area on which to work. So it basically facilitates or makes easier the digestion and assimilation absorption of dietary fat. It doesn't actually do the digesting. It just chops the fats up into little pieces that are more easily worked on by the enzymes that do digest them. Now, the thing to know is that your gallbladder doesn't produce the bile, it's just the storage sack, really. Your liver makes the bile. So even when you have had your gallbladder removed, your body still makes bile. The issue with when you don't have a gallbladder is that the gallbladder in response to certain hormonal signals that happen during the digestive process, the gallbladder contracts and squeezes out the bile into the small intestine, the first part of the small intestine called the duodenum or duodenum, I've heard it pronounced different ways. Um, when you don't have the gallbladder to do that, to contract and squirt that bile out, your liver, because it's still producing the bile, kind of drips out just a steady little trickle of bile. So your body is still producing the bile, it's just the problem is that it may not be matched to the amount or timing of fat in your diet coming through to the digestive tract. It's going to kind of come out just all the time in a little steady trickle. Um, so let's see where... Let's talk about why I said I said the gallbladder contracts and squirts out the bile in response to certain hormonal things that happen during digestion. So where this starts is, and yes, I have notes, um, there is a hormone called cholecystokinin, or CCK for short. Cholecystokinin, if you break this word down, it's C-H-O-L-E-C-Y-S-T-O-K-I-N-I-N, cola cystokinin. Cola means bile, cysto is a sac, and kinin means move. So cola cystokinin is a hormone that moves the bile sac, moves, moves the gallbladder. It's what makes the gallbladder squeeze and squirt that bile out. Um, I'm... I was an English major, a creative writing major, an undergraduate. I'm a word nerd, so I like to, just as a little gee whiz info here in case you're ever on Jeopardy, Kynan, the move, 
Do you know the word kinesiology or kinesthetics? It has to do with movement of the physical body, kinesiology. Or if you know anything about chemistry or biochemistry, there are uh, enzymes called kinases because they move a phosphate group from one molecule to the next. So it's a kinase because it's moving something from one place to the next. Anyway, um, I'm going to read a little bit. I copied and pasted from some, um, you know, Dr. Google about cholecystokinin. Cholecystokinin is secreted by cells of the upper small intestine. Its secretion is stimulated by the introduction of hydrochloric acid, amino acids, or fatty acids into the stomach or duodenum, that first section of the small intestine. Cholecystokinin stimulates the gallbladder to contract and release stored bile into the intestine. So um, CCK, cholecystokinin, is stimulated by the presence of stomach acid and amino acids and fats, especially in that first part of the um, small intestine. So let's see, it's the presence of fat mostly, but also amino acids that stimulate CCK. I'll read, read another paragraph and then talk, break this down a little more. Cholecystokinin plays a role in facilitating digestion within the small intestine. It is secreted from mucosal epithelial cells in the first segment of the small intestine and stimulates delivery into the small intestine of digestive enzymes from the pancreas and bile from the gallbladder. Cholecystokinin is also produced by neurons in the enteric nervous system and is widely, abundant, widely and abundantly distributed in the brain. I actually learned that today when I read that. I did not know there was cholecystokinin in the brain. Maybe that's why we, in general, as a general rule, don't feel satiated with a meal unless there's protein and fat in that meal. If you have nothing but carbohydrate, you're like starving 40 minutes later, right? Maybe that's the drop in blood sugar from the huge release of insulin. Maybe it's also an absence of cholecystokinin. I don't know, I'm speculating there, but anyway, the point is that it is the presence of fat and protein, and to, to a certain extent, that mixture of semi-digested food being very acidic from the hydrochloric acid in the stomach, when that stuff enters the first part of the small intestine, that's what stimulates cholecystokinin. Cholecystokinin tells the gallbladder to squeeze the bile out. So um, again, if you don't have a gallbladder, you don't have the ability to match the timing of the bile and the amount of bile that's coming out with the timing and the amount of the food that you're eating. Your liver's just kind of doot, 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 just putting out some bile. So you still have bile, it just might not match up with the food that you're eating. Now, um, some people who, I guess, it's very rare, but some people who go on a ketogenic diet will have a gallbladder attack. They will have gallstones, if, you know, if they still have their gallbladder. And the thing to know though is, the problem is not the ketogenic diet. The problem isn't the high fat diet. The high fat diet doesn't cause gallstones. Low fat diets cause gallstones because if you need fat, to stimulate CCK, to stimulate the gallbladder, and you've been on a very low fat diet, especially for an extended period of time, a lot of that bile is going to sit in the gallbladder and stagnate and form stones because you need the fat to stimulate the release of bile. When you don't have the fat to stimulate the release of bile, the bile just backs up, backs up, stays there, stones. All of a sudden, when you do a ketogenic diet and you've reintroduced fat overnight into your diet, now the gallbladder, the gallbladder's like, whoa, whoa, we've got, we've got some fat, we gotta send out some bile, but guess what? There's all those stones in the way. So now you're gonna start dislodging stones into that bile duct. It's not the ketogenic diet that caused it, it's the low fat diet that caused it. The ketogenic diet is like, getting the gallbladder to move and it's disrupting all those stones that were already in place because of the lack of fat previously. Um, I like to, just as, as, as more sort of GWIS information, you know, you have to have that, that stimulation of contraction of the gallbladder, otherwise the gallbladder just, just kind of sits there like lymph. 
the lymphatic system in your body, we have like these lymph vessels that kind of mirror the blood vessels, the veins and arteries all throughout our body. But unlike the blood circulatory system that has the heart to pump, to push that blood throughout all the blood vessels, the lymphatic system has no pump. The only thing that gets lymph moving through all those vessels is muscle contraction. Even just walking, moving around, weightlifting, running, but just moving your body at all moves lymph a bit. Um, this is why it's so dangerous to be bedridden for a very long time. It's why people have to, when they're bedridden or they're um, paralyzed or something, they have to have other people literally help move their muscles or do like massage to get the lymph moving because they, if they're you know disabled or paralyzed, they can't do it on their own. Um, so it's, you know, when you're like paralyzed like that, it's not just that your muscles atrophy from disuse, it's that the lymph stagnates and it can pull and just bad stuff happens because lots of good, helpful, essential things need to circulate through those lymph vessels. I'm getting off the map, but I'm just saying like, just like lymph needs to be purposely stimulated to move, so does the gallbladder. So... You know, I mentioned chole, cholecystokinin, C-H-O-L-E, chole is Greek for, bile. that comes from the Greek, by the way, for bile. If that reminds you of cholesterol, pat yourself on the back, one of the primary constituents of bile is cholesterol. Um, bile is, is predominantly made out of cholesterol. It also has a bunch of other ingredients. There's taurine in it, which is a sulfur containing amino acid. So there's lots of other stuff in bile, but the primary, the primary building block is cholesterol. In fact, there are um, cholesterol reducing drugs that are bile acid sequestrants, bile acid sequestrants, and they work by binding to bile in the intestines and sort of facilitating the excretion. It's binding to it so it doesn't get reabsorbed into the body and it, it gets excreted with the feces. You poop it out. Um, and I'm gonna read again, I, I copied and pasted from Dr. Google some interesting stuff about how these drugs work. They're used to lower cholesterol because if cholesterol is a primary constituent of bile, if you can get more bile sequestered in the intestine and sent out through your poop, then your liver is forced to make more bile and it's going to use some cholesterol for that process. Thus, there's less in your bloodstream because it's gonna like suck it up to make bile instead. Um, how do bile acids you questions work? These drugs work by binding to bile acids and preventing the absorption of bile acids from the small intestine. Instead of being absorbed into the blood, the combination of bile acids and the drug, the the bile acid sequestrant is excreted in the feces. In response to lowered bile acids in the body, your liver, your liver will convert cholesterol into more bile acids. Additionally, LDL receptors will also be increased in the liver. These actions help lower cholesterol levels in the blood. LDL receptors are increased in the liver because the liver is like, whoa, we normally reabsorb bile from the intestines. We normal re normally reabsorb a lot of bile, but hey, this person's taking a drug that's not letting us reabsorb that bile, we better send out some LDL receptors to capture more cholesterol so we can synthesize more bile. That's how these drugs lower cholesterol. Bile acid sequestrants bind bile acids in the intestine and increase the excretion of bile acids in the stool. This reduces the amount of bile acids returning to the liver and forces the liver to produce more bile acids to replace the bile acids lost in the stool. In order to produce more bile acids, the liver converts more cholesterol into bile acids, which lowers the level of cholesterol in the blood. Um, let's see what else. Bile acid sequestrants have modest LDL cholesterol lowering effects. Low doses can lower LDL cholesterol by 10 to 15%, but even high doses can only lower LDL cholesterol by approximately 25%. Whoop-de-doo! Um, if you follow my friend Dave Feldman's work over at cholesterolcode.com, or he has his own YouTube channel, Dave Feldman, F-E-L-D-M-A-N, um, he's doing some insanely fascinating research on whether any of us should 
take any special measures to lower our cholesterol. I kind of don't think we should, but as always, I'm not a physician, I'm a nutritionist, I don't provide medical advice, but the point is, that's, I'm just explaining that bile, cholesterol, and, and one way to reduce cholesterol is a pharmaceutical drug that reduces the amount of bile being reabsorbed into the circulation for, or, or reabsorbed to the liver. Um, and again, whether or not you should want to lower your LDL is a matter of huge debate and controversy right now. And interestingly, what are the side effects of bile acid sequestrants? What happens when we don't let the body do what the body's supposed to do? What happens when we interfere with a perfectly normal physiological process? That can't possibly lead to anything bad, right? Oddly enough, it doesn't lead to anything nearly as bad as some of the other cholesterol-lowering medications that we're not talking about here, but what are the side effects of bile acid sequestrants? Bile acid sequestrants are not absorbed into the body. They're designed to stay in the gut, and therefore they do not have systemic side effects affecting other organs. Their most common side effects are gastrointestinal, right? These drugs, however they're designed and formulated, they don't get absorbed into the bloodstream. They stay in the gut, so it makes sense that any side effects they have are going to be GI-related. These include constipation, or diarrhea so you could be stopped up or the opposite of stopped up ha ha won't that be fun abdominal pain bloating flatulence vomiting weight loss uh heartburn or gallstones hello you know like let's let's mess with the body's natural bile control bile feedback system and we could have gallstones what a shock. This is my shocked face. I'm so surprised. Can you, can you see how surprised I look? So anyway, that's kind of all I really need to say about this. Um, can you do keto without a gallbladder? Yeah, tons and tons of people are doing it right now, totally safely, no problem. However, if you do have a problem, how do you know you have a problem? whether you have a gallbladder or not. Um, signs that your gallbladder may need help or that your amount and timing of bile is not matching up appropriately with the food you're eating, mostly is probably gonna be greasy, oily stools. It's almost like you're just not absorbing your dietary fat, you're kind of pooping it out. It's kind of gross, but we've all probably had that at one time or another where your stool is just kind of oily, you know? Um, you know what I say, don't just drop the kids off and run. Don't drop a deuce and run. You should take a look at what's coming out of you. It's very informative. We nutritionists love to talk about poop. We're, we're, we're a hoot at parties. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and maybe some abdominal pain, you know, stuff like that. Um, there is a supplement called ox bile. I guess it's bile they take from cattle or from, you know, from oxen or something. It's bile that you can take in pill form to sort of replace the bile that you either are not producing enough of or it's not matching up with your food. So if you have had your gallbladder removed, if you're not having any problem on keto, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, If you're not having a problem, then you're not having a problem. If you are having a problem, if you suspect that you're not digesting and absorbing fat properly, maybe you wanna look into supplementing with ox bile. And unfortunately, I can't really give you a whole lot of recommendations there. I don't have personal experience with this. I've never tried ox bile. I have a gallbladder. I don't have the greasy stool problem. I mean, once in a blue moon I have it, maybe if I'm sick or something. So um, it's not something I've tried. I could experiment with it just to see what happens, but because I don't have a bile gallbladder problem, I don't know that I would see any difference. I wouldn't know what to look for in terms of these supplements helping or, or making it worse or being indifferent. I, I, I wouldn't know what to look for. 
Um, that's something maybe you can research on your own or especially even better talk to a doctor about it, talk to maybe some other nutritionist that has a little more experience with that particular issue than I do. But you know, there is ox bile. Um, there are certain supplements that are, that are not ox bile, but that are designed to help stimulate the gallbladder. So this would only be if you do have a gallbladder and you're, you seem to be having trouble digesting fats, you could still take ox bile, but there's supplements that contain like taurine or beet, I want to say like beet juice extract, and it shouldn't, it's not like eating beets where you should be concerned about your blood sugar or insulin you're talking like minuscule amounts of extract in a pill form that could maybe still help to stimulate the gallbladder um i don't really know other you know other signs that you're maybe not absorbing fats besides just greasy stools like it's literally passing right through you is maybe just dry skin very dry skin because we need fat we need fat for like lustrous, shiny, luminous skin. And so if you're not absorbing and assimilating fat properly, your skin's gonna look like crap. Um, I think that's it. I think that's it. I mean, like I said, I just, I can just tell you that I know lots and lots of low carbon ketogenic oriented doctors who have patients with no gallbladder that do keto with no problem. Um, if you have a history of gallstones or gallbladder problems, please do consult a doctor, preferably a keto-friendly doctor. Maybe there's some modifications you can make to not trigger another attack or to whatever, help dissolve those stones. There's all kinds of like gallbladder flushes and gallbladder cleanses on the internet where you like drink tons and tons of olive oil and apple juice. Please don't do any of that on your own. If it's physician supervised, please work with a doctor that knows what they're doing, that isn't going to cause you harm, that isn't gonna have some kind of crazy effect. Just be safe, that's the number one concern always, right? Do things safely. Um, don't do anything crazy off the interwebs on your own. And that's it. Keto with or without a gallbladder. We love keto. And I'll see you next time. Remember, if you like these videos, if you find them helpful, subscribe to the channel and you can send some support my way. I'm self-employed. I have no benefits. I have no health insurance. Um, it's not easy to make a go of doing this on your own, of being a writer, of trying to provide content that is hopefully helpful and educational. So you can support me on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash nutrition And I'll have links to all of this in the notes. Um, or, you know, a lot of people don't like Patreon for whatever reasons. You can send a one-time or recurring contribution via PayPal, paypal.com to my email address, toitnutrition at gmail.com. I will also link to a video by Dr. Ken Berry. Some of you are probably huge fans of his. I know I am. I've met him in person. Upstanding dude. Every bit as fun and down to earth and tell it like it is in real life as he seems on his videos. He's dynamite. So Dr. Ken Berry. I think he's done his own video on keto without a gallbladder. So I will also link to that and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.